Selamat datang kembali ke seminar ASEAN mengenai pemeliharaan dan perlindungan warisan kebudayaan di bawah air 2021 di mana petang ini kita akan menyambung program seminar kita pagi hari ini iaitu untuk ke sesi kedua bersama moderatornya Encik Sanjay Kumar Baskaran dari Jabatan Warisan Negara dipersilakan Encik Sanjay Ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the ASEAN Seminar on Preservation and Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage 2021. Thank you for staying with us. We now will turn the mic over to our moderator for this afternoon, Mr. Sanjay Kumar Baskaran. Over to you, Mr. Sanjay. Testing. Thank you, dear MCs. Good afternoon to the distinguished guests, dear presenters, and ladies and gentlemen. We will now continue with the remaining countries' presentation in this session. For our respected speakers, kindly be informed that you will be given 15 minutes of the presentation time, followed by 5 to 10 minutes of Q&A. I humbly request to all of our presenters, please respect the time given so we can allow some time for Q&A, and also we can conclude this session on time. Participants joining in the VBEX platform, you can raise your question in the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we will begin our country presentation this afternoon. Before that, please forgive me if I mispronounce any of our presenters' name. We will begin with the presentation from Myanmar, represented by Mr. Vin Kiaeng, Principal and Director, Field School of Archaeology and Department of Archaeology and National Museum, Ministry of Religious Affairs and Culture, Myanmar. Mr. Vin Kiaeng started as the government employee in Department of General Administration in Yasakyo Township since 1987 and transferred to Department of Archaeology in 1996. He studied and completed the postgraduate diploma in archaeology in Institute of Archaeology, New Delhi, India. He has experience in Bagan Archaeological Museum and some excavation in Upper Myanmar. He has participated in drafting and the activities of the World Heritage Nomination of Pew Ancient Cities, Bagan and Mark Wee. I was there when Bagan was inscribed as the World Heritage Site. Now, he is working in the Field School of Archaeology as well as doing research on Pew culture. With the presentation titled, The Prospect of Underwater Archaeological Heritage in Myanmar, Mr. Vin, I pass this virtual floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, and good afternoon, everyone in Lava. And nice to meet you all in ASEAN budget seminar of presentation and production of Anawana Archaeology. And thank you, Malaysians, for native companies and colleges for a chance my presentation the prospect of Anawada archaeological heritage in Myanmar. In Myanmar, the inception of Anawada archaeological work started in 1940. So at that time, so analysis of antiquities from the Sankan ship work, shipwreck in lower Myanmar. So now it is a great lack of such academy to work up to now. So we have now continued academic work on underwater archaeology. So that's why nano archaeology work unique or institution has not been established. So but we have a recent decades activity like the human resource capacity building or 
our steps. So who joins uh, the programs of Anawana Training in the South Asian community? And also, so we have uh, legis legislation. So actually, Myanmar is sharing the water body of Bay of Bengal and advanced sea of Indian Ocean. So from the south to the uh, from the west to the south, it's the played maritime frontier of the country. And also we have inland river, so that could be navigated across up and down of the country. So our country's geographic city is between Indian and China. So that could be either connection in maritime trade. And also archaeological finds so from the uh, so historical side of the country is pointed out that the Asian maritime sea growth passed through the, the inland area, then it's spread to the southern boat of the Peninsula region. So if we go back our histories about the underwater archaeology, so we have some uh, the uh, contemporary evidences. So like here, the slow inscription of Kinshasa of the Khan video. So it's mentioned about the ship voyage to the Borakaya, so to restore and maintain the temple of Borakaya, so with grants, and also the to support Saban and land grants. So that's uh, the first contemporary evidence to know what's uh, the maritime uh, uh, borage in our history. So the one example that is about the survey archaeology is uh, the key thing who means bears. So the bear was uh, originally donated by key thing who in 1778 to the Shudagong the famous one in Yango. So it, it has uh, about 24 tons. Uh, 11 white height feet height and so six white height uh, diameter and also one feet thick. So uh, after the Anglo Burma War uh, 1826, the British tried to carry that uh, belt to England as a gift of war victory. So when they are uh, so trying to transfer to the ships, it was fallen to the Blind River near Yangon. So the British engineers tried to rescue it, but it was unsuccessful. The Burmese tried to rescue that belt uh, by means of the traditional techniques. So, and then they gave the belt and research in the original place of uh, Shurikom Bagura. So that one, uh, we, we have to know that what's uh, the law tradition of uh, underwater in our country. And the more academic work of underwater actually was uh, then in 1940. So it was requested by the district commissioner to, to the Indian archaeologist, uh, Mr. Pankova Raw, assistant superintendent archaeologist for epigraphy office of Madras Sakha. So he inspected uh, 11 articles of just like four porcelain dishes and a fragment of porcelain dish, jar, a large press board, a small press board, and broken food and a copper lamp. So, in so possibly answer, uh, mainly from the Chinese makes uh, white and blue color. The Chinese characters in the so me in the in the books as means uh, about the Emperor Changhu's uh, fifty centuries of the Ming Dynasty, and the other types of the Chinese ceramics were. Uh, uh, we are in the title of empire, can see that's the 70 and century of the Manchu dynasty. So then uh, the Indian archaeologists give a remark uh, where the Susaramis were so, uh, salvaged from diving. So uh, the mark, remark is about the importance of the uh, seaport Patain, where the, the Saramis were found. The Patain was during the so 50, 70 century, it is important so between the Indian Ocean and China. So that's uh, the first academic uh, uh, we have known from our so maritime history of Myanmar. And the recently, so one of the scholars presented about the study of maritime trade ceramics found in Myanmar. 
by her 90 declines. So she collected 57 ceramic shirts from the locality of Tonde, Nia Yango, Apago, and Miao Mia, Piaoli Delta, Motama in Monsei and Bagan. So most of the ceramics were uh, so Chinese makes from the two campsites. The seven from the European origin, one from the Japan, and the rest are the local makes. And then she gave a so academic analysis on ceramics and gave the, each of types. So that is ranging from the 14th century to the 19th century days. So only two so academic works we have found from our maritime archaeology. But if I so as uh, see so, so our activities like legislation by our ministry, so it's uh, issue uh, three laws. Uh, that's the uh, protection and preservation of ancient monument law, and protection and preservation of antique object law, and protection and preservation of archaeological heritage regions. So such uh, so, so laws uh, mentioned in its in the articles to protect the uh, underwater heritage. So that's uh, for legislation and also knowledge contribution is made by our fiscal law archaeology. So our preschool is founded in 2005 and they teach uh, fundamental concept and basic lecture of the Anawada archaeology. And also uh, as uh, the so human resource uh, capacity building, so we set uh, our steps to join and participate in the underwater archaeology training, meeting, workshop, and conference of the ASEAN community. Here yes, I recorded uh, uh, how many people joined in such uh, the, the, the training of underwater archaeology. And the main things in our presentation is uh, we would like to propose the sites of underwater uh, belongings to two to, to, uh, regional areas that we divided. One is maritime frontier region. So it consists of Rakhine or Arkan coastal region and Delta region of Lua Myanmar and uh, Tenendri region. So that's uh, the coastal region of southern parts of Myanmar. So as uh, inland and water sites, we put uh, divided to river sites and lake sites. And as uh, Rakhine or Arkan coastal regions, the, we have uh, some of the ancient historical evidences so, so about the origins among the Sri Lanka and South and North Indian, Rakhine and Lower Myanmar across the Bay of Bengals. So we have uh, some contacts and evidences. So then in during the medieval times, uh, travel logs with the Rakhine, so by the European traders, missionaries, so we have known about the medieval to maritime trades. And also there's contact with China, Java, Sri Lanka, Africa, Europe, and Mr. Vin, you're muted. Yeah. Yes, sorry, uh, the, the mouse move, move over. Yeah. Okay. And the product of Yakai course, we have notes uh, from the historical evidence, these are rice, ceramic slaves, elephants, precious butter, and spices. And European accounts mentions so that the Yakai coast was busy with the merchandising in the Asian Indian Ocean region. And so merchandise shipped during 16th and 18th centuries were known by a historical report and travel logs like below picture. So the according to the Rakhai scholars, so what they say is Portuguese piracy and the, the war between Morgan and
So here's the merchandise goods found in the historic site of Rakhine area. And also, so we propose the site of the maritime location in Rakhine uh, coastal area. So if we continue the territory region of Lower Myanmar, so it's considered yeah, we river delta and Gulf of Waterfront area. So which play as an important link between Indian Ocean and China. And also the popular glaze jar, Martaban jar was used in the pastel of Arab and Indian traders in 14th century. Later, by the European ships used that jar also. Here's uh, I colored it uh, from the internet website about the Martaban jar. So in the brownish, uh, reddish color, blackish color, and also greenish color, that's uh, uh, classifying as a celadon of the lower Myanmar. So these so may have been in some the shipwrecks of the Southern Asian region. So if I go to the Tunisia region, it is southern coastal line of, of Myanmar, extending over 600 miles and exists as the uh, eastern boundary of Andaman Seas. So it is adjacent to the Gulf of Marfan on the north. Malacca stretch on the south and Siam Gap on the east. So this strategic geographical region so it seems as a gateway or east and west trade corridor since ancient time, and also it is an important maritime region for Siam and Myanmar. The southern silk roads through inland waterway and then so stretch to the southernmost of the Myanmar. So in southernmost of Myanmar. The sites Maliwa and Orgis revealed by our archaeological exploration and excavation, which revealed uh, uh, the goods, uh, the trade goods related to the ancient Indian and China. So, Saka, so we can date it to the 3rd century BC to the 1st century BC. Uh, for the inland so water archaeology, uh, the past river hinterland, so we put Focus on Eau and Chinu River. The Eau River is over so 1,400 miles long. So it flows from the northern most Kachin state to the uh, southern Atman Seas. So in Asian and medieval cities, town and historic sites situated in the vicinity of the river. So which is so because of relying on the river for transportation, trade, administration, and natural resources. Once the capital of the uh, Takao, Mandalay, Marabura, Inwa Pagan are now sitting on the river bank. So here I would like to uh, express uh, uh, the uh, tra tradition that we tell about the loss of Pagan Tambes and Bura. So it says, Shwila Ta Wawa Wen, Pagan Paya Yi Chu Sin. Pagan Bura and Tambes went down to the to take bath at moonlight at night. The riddle can be understood as that the monuments of Pagan have been washed away by the uh, flood erosion of the Yawi River. So finally, the river's erosion on material and cultural remains made and the water archaeological deposition on the river bed. Here uh, we market uh, the historical sites along the Iau River. So uh, we have not yet uh, fully explored on that site, but uh, historical evidence tells about the so some sculptural remains along the river bank. And the last one is lake sites. So lake sites in Myanmar so could be seen as the uh, Tarasuya Lake, Duke Stream Lakes, Haley Valley Lakes, and ancient Gugunet Mouse, etc. So the basinry or lakes uh, put a threat to the uh, settlement or village, even the urban settlements, and uh, finally left the agricultural remains on, on the lake bed. So for example, Tautama Lake near Manali. So once it was uh, the, the Neolithic settlement area, and uh, the famous uh, Indian lakes, uh, so about the 50 kilometer long, uh, it's also uh, the, there's uh, the some of the prehistoric sites uh, 
and not only the surrounding area, but also inner areas of the, the lake. So that's why we can sum up, sum up uh, our so proposed site of Anawara archaeology and heritage are uh, three steps according to the historical evidence, local records, and on ground visibility, but not completely explore and register them. So as a recent condition of Anawada archaeology in Myanmar, uh, the last and first so exploration was conducted in 1940. That's I mentioned at the, during the British time, colonial time, at the study of Indian archaeologists. Uh, uh, from that time, so we were lacks a great time, a very long time, so over about so over 100 years. But uh, we try to, to uh, uh, grow ourselves so by means of teaching basic concepts and lecture in our preschool of archaeology and also uh, human capacity buildings so by participating in Asian ASEAN seminar, conference, meeting, workshop, and training. And also we have the legislation or law. So, but uh, uh, lack of the, the practical work or academic uh, marine archaeology works, we don't have the regulation, charters, guidance, planning for the production and exploration of Anawada archaeology. So, but uh, anyway, uh, so our attempts on this seminars about the probable sites so will be necessary for any further prospect of the study of related Anawara archaeology. And moreover, so these sites are concerned for the newly establishment of Anawara archaeology works of Myanmar. So here, the seminar, so we can learn from our ASEAN colleagues uh, how much uh, advanced KFU practicing in the Anawara of the Southeast Asia and South China seas, etc. And also, we will see uh, our colleagues of Thailand, Vietnam, and so we can learn so mostly from our neighbors. Then, so, so we, we, we can uh, uh, propose with our site. And also, uh, so one day or the future, so we could uh, establish uh, our so academic unit or institution of Anawara archaeology. So, uh, please, your discussion and question. So, my presentation is uh, that's all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vin Kiaying, for your wonderful presentation for taking us through the process of the underwater archaeology in Myanmar. Uh, one thing that really took my attention of your presentation is currently there are three sets of laws or the protection of underwater heritage in Myanmar. So are there any questions from our participants? Okay, I believe we don't have any questions. Uh, so, yes. Okay, so I guess we can sum up the session of Mr. Vien Kia Ying. Uh, thank you so much. And can we have a round of applause for Vien Kia Ying for his wonderful presentation? Ladies and gentlemen, let us now move to the second session of the presentation from the Philippines. We will have two presenters who will be giving a presentation titled Past, Present and the Future Directions of Research and Preservation of Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage in the Philippines. The presenter will be Mr. Nero Montalban Ostero. Uh, Senior Museum Researcher, Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division, National Museum of the Philippines. His current research interests include stone materials and seagoing artillery from 
different shipwreck sites from the Philippines. He's, oh, he obtained his master's degree in marine science from the Marine Science Institute, University of Philippines, Diliman, and bachelor's degree in biology, major in marine biology from the Visaya State University of the Philippines. And our co-presenter, Ms. Rachel Angelina Ureta, who is a museum researcher at the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division of the National Museum of the Philippines. She received her degree in Bachelor in Science Chemistry from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is currently pursuing her master's degree in Material Science and Engineering in the same university. She is presently working on the material analysis of ceramics and glass beads from Philippine shipwreck site using spectroscopy techniques. Wow, you're tangible indeed. Okay, dear presenters, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Nero, are you ready? Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I just have some technicality. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, okay. So can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, if it possible. Uh, yeah. Yes, now it's in full screen. Okay. Right, thank you so much for that. And once again, to the organizers of this seminar, uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, it is correct that uh, it will be a co-presentation with my colleague, Rachel Aleta. And once again, our presentation is entitled The Past, Present, and the Future Directions of Research and preservation of maritime and underwater cultural heritage in the Philippines. All right, so to start with, oh, here. Okay, so um, to start with the emergence of the maritime archaeology in the Philippines. So basically, these are not the complete reasons of um, activities as well as excavations and other underwater archaeological activities in the country but these are most of the significant ones all right so to start with the national museum of the philippines was first established as the insular museum of ethnology um, natural history and commerce in 1901 and then in 1967 the discovery of um, a galleon or a shipwreck uh, on, off the Gulf of Albay in 1967 was uh, dubbed as the, um, the dawn of maritime archaeology in the Philippines. And then in 1976, the Putuan boats were discovered accidentally by treasure hunters. Then the underwater archaeology unit was created in 1979, which was later uh, renamed as the underwater archaeology section, which was headed by Dr. Desedra Dizan in 1989. Between the years 1985 and 1989, uh, the excavations of the Kandula Show, the Canyon San Jose, as well as the East India Company vessel, the Griffin uh, shipwreck, which was loaded with mostly um, uh, tea trade material. And then from 1990 to 1991, uh, the, both Hawaiian Shoal and Breaker Reef shipwrecks, or 13th century shipwrecks, were excavated. Both were found with um, mostly uh, Chinese steam by ceramics, as well as uh, stone anchor stock with uh, features typical of anchor stock uh, for um, wooden anchors used by uh, Chinese merchant uh, vessels. And then uh, between 1992 and 1993 were the subsequent excavations of the Galleon San Diego, uh, which was uh, commanded by um, Captain General uh, An Antonio de Morga. Um, which was a, a Manila gallon uh, converted into a warship that sank uh, near the Fortune Island in Batangas after a lengthy naval engagement with the Dutch uh, vessel. 
And then in 1995, the Pandanal Shoal shipwreck was excavated. Uh, this was a Southeast Asian vessel based on its cargo, where um, ceramics from the North and uh, Central region in Vietnam uh, comprised about 70% of all uh, ceramics cargo. And then from 1996 to 1997, the San Isidro shipwreck, as well as the Lina Shoal, which in contrast to the Pandanan Shoal, um, this was found with um, a majority of the artifacts were mostly high-fired um, glazed porcelain and stoneware Chinese ceramic, and with only uh, limited pieces from Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and Burma. Also, the Earl Temple shipwreck, another uh, uh, East India Company vessel, which was found with uh, mostly uh, heavy materials such as metals, uh, cannons, as well as um, stone materials, including the Armenian gravestone that belongs to a uh, certain uh, Sultan David. And then between 2000 and 2001 was the excavation of the Española shipwreck in, the, in, in Palawan. So this shipwreck was uh, estimated to be uh, around uh, 14th century. Uh, interestingly, um, a, a small caliber, about one inch caliber, swivel gun was also found on the site, uh, probably of um, Portuguese in origin, so which makes it more intriguing because the Portuguese did not reach the Southeast Asian waters until the 16th century. Uh, for instance, um, 1511 in, in Milaka as well as 1521 in the And then we have uh, the uh, Royal Captain uh, Shipwreck, uh, which is another East India Company vessel. Um, well, was retrieved in 1999. So basically, the, the shipwreck lies uh, about 300 meters deep. From 2003 to 2007, the excavation of uh, the excavation of uh, sorry, the excavation of the Tagbita Bay. Um, this was a European vessel. Uh, a late 19th century European vessel. Among the significant finds were uh, the brass frame sextant as well as the marine sand glass. Sorry. All right, and in 2016, uh, our division was uh, created. Uh, the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division uh, between 2007 and 2019, a World War II shipwreck expedition in collaboration with the National Museum of the Philippines and the RV Petrel, a private research vessel owned by the late Paul Allen uh, of Microsoft. This ex uh, expedition was focused uh, on the Battle of Surigao Strait as well as the Battle of Ormuk Bay. And then in 2019 still, continuation of the World War II shipwreck expedition, as well as the investigation and documentation of the Al Capitan, and the survey and exploration of the Galleon Sunset. All right, so again, our division, uh, Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division, uh, was tasked uh, to do archaeological researches, shipwrecks, uh, coastal and foreshore archaeological sites as well as the assessment, investigation, and protection of uh, World War II shipwrecks. So currently, we're, we're able to acquire a few of our equipment, such as the rugged uh, hulled inflatable boat, as well as our metal detectors and uh, side scan sonar. So um, as a result of those several excavations, survey and explorations from the past, we're able to identify at least five uh, NCTs or National Cultural Treasures. So these are the Butuan boats, which were um, accidentally discovered by treasure hunters. Um, recent carbon dating analysis uh, put those boats um, at age between 8th to the 10th centuries. And then next NCT is a blue and white, a blue and white uh, bow from the Pandanal Shoal shipwreck with a central design of two fabled beasts the Kilin and the Phoenix, which are both very important motifs of the Chinese mythology. Next is another blue and white 
uh, Josh from the Lena Show with a central design of a flying elephant, a religious uh, representation, probably of Tibetan Buddhism, of the Mount of uh, Samantha Bhadra, the uh, Bodhisattva of Universal uh, Endeavor. The next NCT is the Golden Seal or the Gold Seal of Antonio de Morga, uh, the Captain General of, of the uh, Galleon uh, San Diego. So um, the discovery or the um, discovery of this um, seal was a clear evidence that uh, the shipwreck found was indeed the San Diego Galleon. Another uh, NCT was an astrolabe, a navigational instrument, also from the San Diego shipwreck. So this is just to show you the, uh, well, our most recent uh, expedition in collaboration with the RV Patrol uh, research uh, vessel. So from April 6 to May 1 in 2019. So that includes a Subic Bay excavation, I mean, uh, expedition in search for the World War II or Yokomaru and USS New York. Also in Tabla Strait in search for the uh, MB Duna past uh, ferry as well as the empty fixture tanker. In Sulu Sea, in search for the World War II Amana Bay. The West Palawan, in search for the World War II IJN Atago and uh, IJN Maya. Uh, as well as in San Jose Mindoro, in search for the P-24 bomber plane. Also, uh, World War II shipwrecked uh, Omane Bay. So, in photos is, well, here is the RV Patrol uh, equipped with the uh, state-of-the-art ROVs, as well as the full part of the MB Dunia class and the propeller of uh, Vector's tanker, and the presumed IJN Atago, the Gantt's part, as well as of, uh, that uh, of the IJN Maya. Also, uh, the Lubang Island Survey and Explorers in 2019 uh, was uh, started from October 16 to November 5 in 2019. This was in uh, to search for the remains of the Spanish galleon San Jose. San Jose was uh, one of the biggest galleons uh, of its time. Uh, it measured about 60 meters in length. It was stuck on a reef in Luok Bay, Lubang Island in Mindoro Occidental in 1994, uh, while trying to seek refuge from a storm. The vessel sank along with the 400 crews and 12,000 cargo. So these are the vessels. Uh, that were used during the exploration. Uh, the person in front of the computers is uh, Mr. Frank Godio, uh, the founder of the Far Eastern uh, Foundation for Nautical Archaeology. So uh, during the course of the exploration, uh, the uh, anchor of the Galleon San Jose was found, as well as a few blue and white uh, miniature uh, bottles. Uh, these are just the most recent conferences so seminars attendees as well as trainings so for international um, seminars and trainings we have the fourth papa as papa conference in bangkok we have attended also the ASEAN uch meeting in bangkok as well the international archaeological conference in malaysia which was attended and participated by uh, sir um, bobby aureli Nada. the ftir training in singapore attended by miss rachel oretta and some local conferences attended by, well, mostly uh, by uh, Sir Bobby Perlinada, and the workshop on the database management with ontology uh, attended by Ms. Rachel Loretta. So to continue with this presentation, we have Ms. Rachel Loretta. Rachel? Thank you, Nero, and good afternoon, everyone. So for the second part of our presentation, I will be focusing my discussion on the programs and activities undertaken by the National Museum during the pandemic or the new normal um, and the challenges faced in the protection and preservation of UCH as well as the future plans and research of the division. So first, I will start with the legal protection of UCH in the Philippines. So the RA 4846 and the Preservation Act of 1966 amended in 1974 states that ships or boats in part or in whole are considered as cultural properties. So a policy guideline on underwater archaeology was created in 1983. And st starting from here, the 
underwater archaeology unit collaborated with different um, private groups that could financially support the exploration and excavation projects. And the National Museum Act was created in 1998, while the National Heritage Act was established in 2009. So the UCH is considered as an archaeological area and the treasure hunting permits were issued by the National Museum. And the guidelines on the methodology of survey exploration, excavation, and post-excavation activities and its mandate was also extended. So at present, the protection of UCH um, is strengthened through the National Museum of the Philippines Act, and the regulatory functions were transferred to another government agency, which is the National Commission of Culture and the Arts, or NCCA. And recently, um, they published the guidelines governing the issuance of the treasure hunting permits. Next slide, please. So because of the travel restrictions and safety health protocols during the pandemic, um, underwater explorations were constrained. And in some cases, we had to cancel our um, field work with uh, our collaborators. And with this, we have been focusing instead on material analysis, collection management, and strengthening of our public awareness programs. And we have been conducting material analysis on the shipwreck materials like ceramics, bits, stones, and other metals to give insight on their material composition, provenance, and proper con conservation treatment. So we have been using non-destructive analytical techniques including um, optical microscopy for surface examination, um, the spectroscopy techniques, including the handheld XRF for elemental analysis, and FTIR and Raman spectroscopy for mineral identification. We also use um, powder XRD for mineral composition of stones and sherds. So using the data that we collect from this analysis, we have been drafting um, scientific papers and research for publication and information dissemin dissemination. Next slide, please. So the maintenance of collections is very important, as we all know, in the preservation of cultural heritage resources. And in the museum, we con continuously work on the inventory and documentation of these artifacts to collect valuable information for research. And we are also updating our um, database using the FileMaker software. So this is very helpful for the digitization of our collections. Next slide, please. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we all realized that social media is a very important tool for um, the individuals and communities to stay connected even while physically separated. So using social media platforms like uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube is very efficient in sharing factual and relevant information about our cultural heritage. And the National Museum has developed its Museum from Home program to strengthen the relationship of the museum and its communities, especially those who have limited access to our facilities um, brought about by the closure of the museum due to the health protocols or physical limitations. So through these social media platforms, we sh share to the public the updates on archaeological research and museum works. As part of our uh, Museum from Home program, the National Museum has also upgraded its website. It is also in celebration of our um, 120th anniversary. So the new website intends to be a reliable um, online information resource site that can serve the needs um, and interests 
of um, the audiences locally, nationally, and um, globally. So here we also feature some of the significant artifacts from different shipwreck sites in the Philippines. Another part of our Museum from Home program is the Maritime Monday Posts. So every Monday, we are featuring one artifacts or um, one shipwreck story, which is posted on our social media platforms and website. So here are some of the posters featured on our Maritime Monday. Next slide, please. We have also conducted um, lectures and paper presentations on local and international conferences for information dissemination. So here are some of the conferences that we had been part of. Um, in these lectures, we share our research findings. We also raise uh, public awareness on the protection and preservation of UCH. And we also conduct um, campaigns against looting or treasure hunting and we increase uh, public knowledge on underwater archaeology and we promote the appreciation of UCH. So this has also been a platform for networking with different archaeological or cultural institutions. Next please. So every September in celebration of the Maritime and Archipelagic Nation Awareness Month, we are also conducting the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Forum as part of our educational programs. So this year, we conducted the third MUCH Forum with the theme, Significance and Applications of Material Analysis in Maritime Archaeology. So in this forum, speakers and experts from um, select NMP um, divisions discuss the concepts and significance of different technical analysis and their applications to material culture studies. Next, please. Since our galleries were closed to the public, we took um, this time to curate and set up exhibitions. So included are the 300 years of maritime trade in the Philippines and the submerged history, the Marinduque shipwrecks. So for the 300 years of maritime trade in the Philippines, it showcases the material evidence recovered from shipwreck sites found in the Philippines dated from the 13th, 15th, and 16th century CE. So it highlights seven shipwrecks. And then the submerged history showcases the direct material evidence of um, Marinduque's active participation in local and international maritime trade that helped shape its current vibrant and remarkable culture. So this is also in coordination with our regional museum in Marinduque. Next slide, please. And also, since our galleries were closed, and we can't do exhibit launching physically, we prepared virtual gallery tours, which are posted in our official um, National Museum YouTube channel. And presently, we are also working on the reconstruction of other exhibitions, including the San Diego Gallery. Next, please. So as we all know that the management and protection of um, UCH is a difficult task because of the many challenges it poses. And the COVID-19 pandemic makes its management and campaigns more difficult. And we all know also that underwater surveys and explorations are expensive. And this is one of the challenges that we are facing, the limited funding and insufficient budget. And also underwater archaeologists um, must also have proper training and knowledge. And um, right now we are um, lacking qualified personnel for these tasks, considering the increased number in archaeological sites to be studied. And there is um, also somewhat a lack of 
strict implementation of the policies for UCH activities. And of course, the major challenge is the treasure hunting or illicit trade and antiquant collecting, which greatly causes loss of significant information of our history. Next, please. So with these challenges, we have um, been planning our plans for um, research and UCH management in the um, next few years. So now that the vaccination numbers rise and our situation slowly eases, and as the museum is um, uh, already open to the public with minimum health restrictions, we are planning our next um, field works or underwater research projects. Included in this are the management of World War II shipwrecks and the survey of shipwreck sites that needs to be explored again, like the Butuan and um, uh, Katanawan sites. And included in our future plans is the personnel development with the priority in the refresher course on scuba diving and conservation training workshop and also capacity building training and for underwater archaeology research. And also we um, expect to hire more personnel working in maritime archaeology. And also important is the establishment of partnerships or collaborations for um, museum works and archaeological research. So we intend to collaborate on, on with archaeological institutions, national government agencies involved in cultural heritage and underwater preservation, and other international research institutions. Next, please. So um, raising awareness is probably one of the best possible way to preserve our cultural heritage, and we are hoping to increase and strengthen the public awareness programs um, we want to continue what we are doing in the museum from home programs and other educational programs. This also includes the digitization of records and databases to make the collections and their study more available to the public. And it is also important to involve the stakeholders for the management and protection of UCH. Um, examples are the diving communities um, who are establishing their own shipwreck databases and uh, um, some are actively involved in discussion forums uh, so our role as the leading agency in the protection of uch is to be able to facilitate and influence the discussions yeah, yeah. Re regarding research protection and accessibility of sites and lastly there should also be a strict implementation of policies Thank you very much for actively listening in our language. Thank you to both of our presenters uh, for sharing the chronology of the underwater research legislation and laws in place in Philippines and also your activities and the future course of actions. And when looking at the challenges being shared by you, I believe the challenges are not only faced by the Philippines, it's also a global challenge in any of our heritage organizations. So do we have any questions? Uh, dear participants, for those of you who have any questions, you can put it either in the chat box and for those who are following us in, on the Facebook, you can raise your question in the comment sections. And please be informed that our experts are really busy, so this is your chance to raise the questions where we have gathered all the experts in one platform. I Yes, there's no questions. So thanks again to Mr. Nero and Ms. Rachel. So can we have a round of applause to both of our presenters from the Philippines? Okay. Okay. The 
next presentations will be from our southern neighbors, Singapore. We have also two presenters who will be presenting on investing the potential of maritime archaeology in Singapore. Allow me to first introduce our presenter, Mr. Michael Ng from ASEAN's Yuso Isha Institute. Michael graduated with a Bachelor of Art Honours in Linguistics and Multilingual Studies, minoring in History from the Nanyang Technology University. In 2014, he joined the Archaeology Unit at ASEAN's Yuso Isha Institute as a research officer. Michael has been involved in both terrestrial and underwater archaeological projects in Singapore, Indonesia, Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, Australia, and Jordan and since 2009. He also organizes archaeology outreach program for education institution in Singapore. And our co-presenter, Mr. Aaron Kao, also from the same institute, ICS. Aaron graduated with BA Distinction in Fine Arts from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology and has a Master's of Studies in Archaeology from the University of Oxford. He joined the archaeology unit in 2015 as a research officer after nearly a decade as a volunteer and has taken part in many local and overseas excavation in Cambodia, Myanmar and Indonesia. Look like both of our presenters have well traveled throughout the world. He co-directed the Trawas Archaeology or Art History Field School in East Java in 2018. His research interests include due to earthenware production and distribution island and coastal archaeology, and battlefields archaeology. Dear presenters, please take it over from here. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to present in this event. So good afternoon to all my esteemed colleagues and friends. Today, my co-worker, Aaron, and I would like to present Singapore's plan to navigate the challenges faced while protecting maritime cultural heritage by investigating the potential of maritime archaeology in Singapore. So this is the table of contents for our presentation, just a quick one. And I'll move on to uh, the archaeology agencies in Singapore. So Aaron and I work for the archaeology unit, one of the two Singapore agencies actively engaging in archaeological work. We are a part of the Thomasic History Research Center and IC ICS Yusof Fishup Institute. Our institute is a statutory board under the Ministry of Education and the other agency working on archaeology is located at the Nanyang Technological University. We work closely with our colleagues from the Heritage Research and Assessment Division, a department within the National Heritage Board, a government agency that oversees heritage and archaeological work. So the archaeology unit, uh, which is us, does both fieldwork and post-excavation process between 2019 to present. Our main focus were research, artifact processing, and public education. Here you can see my colleagues sorting and cataloging artifacts from the 2015 Empress Place excavation, and my colleague Aaron analyzing the fabric of a local pottery shirt for his research. As part of our public education efforts, uh, we continue to engage the community through our Archaeology Program for Students, or APS. This program is organized for students and educators in Singapore. And through the program, we hope to nurture an understanding of archaeology as a discipline and foster an appreciation of archaeology and history in Singapore and Southeast Asia. In the light of the current COVID situation, most of the lectures have transcended into virtual classes and workshops. Occasionally, we do have small windows of opportunity to conduct workshops for students and teachers and here you can see teachers and students learning more about archaeology through a variety of uh, activities. We also produce two series of info cards as teaching materials for educators. These cards are meant to excite students over the artifacts found in Singapore and show that archaeology is more than just a study of artifacts. Each featured artifact is thoughtfully curated with clear illustrations, bite-sized historical narratives, and structured research tasks. The archaeological findings provide a framework for questions about economics, cultural geography, ecology, and food procurement, to name just a few, that can stimulate students' interest in learning more about the past. This year, we also organized an online webinar series from July 2021 to January 2022. 
And this webinar series comprises of a variety of comprehensive introductory lectures in archaeology and art history of Southeast Asia, with a focus on the pre-modern to the modern periods. It covers topics from major Southeast Asian land and maritime civilizations over the last 1,000 years and highlights the rich cultural heritage of ancient Southeast Asian societies. Um, so the current state of Singapore's archaeology is still uh, what we call in progress. So our legislation in Singapore is still a work in progress. And it's still uh, being discussed and hopefully it will be passed in Parliament soon. Uh, we also have an ongoing SG Heritage Plan, which was implemented since 2018. It's the first master plan for the future of Singapore's heritage and museum sector. And the plan outlines the broad strategies and initiatives for the sector from 2018 to 2022 and beyond. So currently, this plan seeks to review the legislation to protect the protect uh, to improve the protection of Singapore's archaeological heritage, uh, strengthen the act, and introduce a framework to govern archaeology in Singapore. These changes to the legislation will also be extended to the protection of Singapore's maritime archaeology within. Singapore's territorial waters. To, uh, second, to conduct surveys to identify sites of archaeological interest, to identify and map out terrestrial sites of uh, archaeological interest in Singapore. So the surveys findings will help ensure that sites with archaeological potential can be documented before they are redeveloped. Thirdly, we also hope to develop archaeological capabilities. Uh, NHB, National Heritage Board, will help build up local archaeological capabilities by partnering with existing stakeholders to support research and other capacity building initiatives. And lastly, one of the most important initiatives is uh, NHB will work in partnership with research institutions to create greater awareness of archaeology in Singapore. So threats faced by maritime sites in Singapore, uh, there are a couple of them. And one of the more significant ones uh, that exists will be actually down south of Singapore at the Anchorage area. So Singapore Strait itself is historically one of the busiest waterways in the world. Numerous ships would pass through this route or anchor off the coast of Singapore. The Anchorage and the presence of so many ships might damage potential maritime sites in the area marked in the yellow box. The shipping lanes are also dangerous to conduct any underwater archaeological investigations due to the immense shipping traffic, bad visibility and depth within the waterway. Economic and developmental use of waters could also affect the conservation of maritime archaeological sites. As reclamation work continues, previous maritime or underwater sites would be buried before being discovered or properly recorded. Well, one possible example of a buried underwater site in Singapore lies beneath the Singapore Changi Airport. It's believed that ships and boats may have sunk in the area during the 1603 naval battle of Singapore, which involved the Dutch Portuguese and the Johor Sultanate. And one of the significant upcoming developments in Singapore is the Greater Southern Waterfront Project. This development will potentially affect any maritime cultural heritage sites in the south of Singapore. My colleague will highlight a research case study regarding this area. So Singapore is an island nation surrounded by water and historically has been a maritime community. Therefore, we feel that our maritime cultural landscape includes underwater, foreshore and coastal sites. And to safeguard Singapore's maritime cultural heritage in the foreseeable future, there will be a need to craft an effective plan and a clear direction to better manage our maritime archaeological resources. Therefore, we advocate creating a maritime cultural heritage site register to account for various underwater foreshore and coastal sites. The main aim of the register is to enable us to properly inform the multiple stakeholders and agencies on potential sites and actions can be taken preemptively before any development takes place. It will also provide us with an overview to conduct site monitoring, archaeological evaluation, rescue, and research archaeology more efficiently. The creation of this site register will require four elements. Firstly, extensive archival research on the maritime cultural heritage of Singapore. Secondly, surveys are to be conducted at these sites. And due to time and manpower constraints, we will need to augment our current strength by employing geophysical methods and instruments to conduct these surveys. Thirdly, active engagement with stakeholders. Thankfully, we have very close relationship with our partners from the National Heritage Board and have been actively engaging 
with government and private development agencies. Lastly, the information we obtain from our research should be made available to the public through publications or other effective means in our current day and age. The register will classify the sites based on the recommendations provided in Unit 4 of the Training Manual for UNESCO Foundation course authored by uh, Dr. Martin Mendes. We will classify these sites based on known, unknown, and future archaeological resources. And this classification will help us plan for the work required to protect these maritime culture heritage sites. So I shall now pass on to my colleague, Aaron, to elaborate further on potential research case studies. Aaron, thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, can. Yes, clearly. Give me a second to share my slides. Can everybody see my slides? Yes. Yes. Can you put it in the full screen mode? Is it in a full screen mode now? Not yet. What about now? I guess still no. I think I'm having some technical problems. Uh, Michael, are you able to share my slides from your end? Uh, yeah, Ken, I can share your slides. Sorry for yes. the... Okay, I will be sharing very briefly about underrepresentation in maritime archaeology. And this covers a selection of sites and artifacts in chronological fashion and geographical overlaps that are above and below ground as well as under the sea. The first case talks about the geological characterization of 14th century earthenware in a maritime small world. The second case will investigate the potential archaeology of early modern sea nomad villages on Pulau Brani and thirdly, the 19th to 20th century coastal artillery sites. Next slide, please, Mikey. Unbeknown to many, modern development and the lack of archaeological capacity to investigate and document island and coastal sites are equal, if not greater, than those of shipwreck sites. This stems partly from the lack of understanding and recognition of the maritime cultural landscape. Research on the well-known 14th century port settlement of Tomasic, for example, is often limited to its role in long-distance trade. The ancient port now buried under the modern city is, has also influenced the terrestrially biased approach by researchers. Ultimately, this ignores the fact that the site is intrinsic and contiguous with the human exploitation of the liminal zone between land and water throughout time and space. Next slide, please, Mikey. The coarse earthenware of Singapore often receive lesser research attention. Some researchers also believe that they offer little to no information. Next slide, please, Mikey. But analysis of the cause variety has revealed that a notable portion was not locally produced, but may originate from the highland and lowlands of Sumatra and Java. Based on soil data and clay samples, only one out of the six identified fabric groups possess mineralogical consistency with the local geology. Next slide, please, Mikey. The non-local fabric groups, although heterogeneous in mineralogy, share the occurrence of minerals that are found only in sedimentary deposits originating from an iron-rich volcanic parent rock source. These artifacts also differ in morphology, notably the pyroclastic group. 
More importantly, the production and distribution of these ceramics represent the smaller and closer maritime networks that probably existed before, during, and after Tomasek. Next slide, please, Mikey. When examined through concepts in maritime archaeology, these networks reflect coastscapes and maritime small worlds that form regional and inter-regional maritime cultural spheres. Aspects that set these networks apart are geographical scale, frequency of travel, seafaring skills, nautical technology, and modes of exchange. These networks were likely robust due to the shorter distances and stronger human ties and probably expanded and contracted the rise and fall of ephemeral long-distance trading. The proportion of non-local coarse earthenware is noteworthy as it serves to broaden the archaeological narrative that is often dominated and limited by high-fired ceramics. And this research sets a material baseline for further investigations into specific coast-to-coast -coast links that has over the years been based merely on probable assumption. To put this in perspective, the movement of native pottery formed part of the long durée of maritime societies in Southeast Asia since time of antiquity. Next slide, please, Mikey. Thank you. Certainly, if we consider the longevity of this seafaring culture, the Orang Laut or sea nomad tribes in Singapore cannot be excluded from the maritime cultural landscape. Indeed, from their apparent vibrancy in history and ethnography, it tells of a society in enormous flux, from conflict to displacement and acculturation. But the archaeology of the Orang Laut remains challenging because of their nomadic lifestyle and rudimentary material culture. Clearly, this leaves little to no visibility in the archaeological record. Is the archaeology of the Orang Laut possible? Next slide, see, please, Mikey. Here, I explore the potential of Pulau Brani, an island south of Singapore, which used to be home to an Orang Laut community from as early as the 16th century to the middle of the 19th century. Next slide, please, Mikey. The island will soon be developed, and this may provide archaeology the opportunity to nuance the subtlety of the Orang Laut as these wetland sites under the present-day container walls. Next slide, please, Mikey. Marked the end of the Orang Laut's centuries-old transition from a prestigious maritime power since the first millennium to the beginning to being marginalized, semi-sedentary, coastal dwellers that over time are no longer visible in today's Singapore. Next slide, please, Mikey. The method I propose is to find and identify the Orang Laut. Drawing from ethnographic and historical data, this table shows the evolution of their life ways. It takes into consideration their spatial domain and habitat, dwelling and mobility, economy, identity in terms of nobility and maritime aggression, and religion. These lines of inquiries can, can be set against archival materials that reflect site usage over time. Next slide, please, Mikey. Compared to the rest of the island, these villages remain intact till the 1970s and the intertidal zones underlying the villages could potentially provide excellent preservation of material culture, including food waste, which, for example, may delineate religion-based diet vis-a-vis -vis the distinction between Orang Laut and Malays. It is recommended that due to the significance of these sites that physical assessment should precede development. Next slide, please, Mikey. One of the challenges faced by development of cultural heritage management in Singapore is the problem with what to do with coastal fortifications and how to study them meaningfully. Next slide, please. Despite development, there are still a number of structures that remain buried or stand forlorn amidst, amidst urban spaces. These sites vary in form, function, and built. Next slide, please. While scholarship on this topic remains limited to military history genre, Archaeology, on the other hand, which was carried out in an ad hoc, site-specific manner, fails to address their wider significance. An aspect which could potentially form the basis for the long-term preservation and management. Now, if we consider the previous case studies worthy of the maritime cultural landscape, the more these battlefield sites should not be excluded. The point of departure I'm proposing is to recognize that these sites are human responses that mirror not only evolution of armaments, 
but also nautical technology, seafaring skills, and communication. Next slide, please, Mikey. More importantly, research has shown that the sighting of guns are intrinsically linked to the desire to master the coastal geography in order to dominate and predict the naval battlefield. It is apparent that war planners considered the relationship between the shape of the coast, soundings, tight patterns, wind, reefs, and islands with the performance of enemy ship design. Next slide, please, Mikey. Interestingly, the richness of these facts are not often found in the physical remains, but in archival materials, which also provide insights into the lives of artillerymen who had clearly developed a physical and mental relationship with the sea. Next slide, please, Mikey. In closing this presentation, the maritime cultural landscape indeed is not limited to these sites, but embody a wide spectrum of unexplored representations. These case studies serve only to reflect the potential for coastal archaeology to bridge the shared domains between sea and land. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much to both of our presenters uh, for enlightening us on the potential of the maritime archaeology of the Singapore. When looking at your presentation, then we see one of the case study is that investing the archaeology of the Orang Laut. Here, Here we, we prove that archaeology is not about what we find, but also who are there. Well, who are the people working behind the artifacts that we discovered here? As the concept of heritage and people cannot be separated, that been correlated for centuries than happening here. So now we'll move to the Q&A sessions. Do we have any Q&A? Okay, I believe we have one Q&A uh, from Hazrin Jas Melaka. Do, do your places, the heritage items, coordinates in any map? Uh, so who would like to answer this question? Uh, Aaron, Aaron, maybe Aaron can answer that. Uh, can you repeat the question again? The question is, do you place the heritage items coordinates in any map? So uh, yes, we do, but uh, yes, we do. But currently, we uh, we do not have a public platform where we share that information at the moment. But we are working towards uh, a platform where more information, especially the context and uh, uh, geographical aspects of these uh, artifacts, can be can be made public and shared. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. So, hope that answers the question. Are there any more questions? Hello. 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 Hey, Hi. Is there anyone talking? Hello, my name is Mazli. Hi, Mazli. Mazli. Okay, my name is Mazli. I'm from University Hello. of Tonganyu. I'm a senior lecturer. I'm uh, teaching for the salvage and uh, uh, underwater heritage uh, policy and law. So I will ask a uh, panel regards to the how you want to sustain to ensure that um, the, the sustainability of the uh, maritime ecology uh, in uh, Singapore. Uh, do you have any uh, guidelines or do you have any, um, uh, for example, for the ecology uh, legal aspect uh, uh, in terms of the uh, um, uh, what, uh, enforcement, for example, uh, and also uh, the implementation of the law itself? Thank you. Uh... I think in regards to policy, we are working very closely with the Na uh, National Heritage Board uh, to work on legislation as well as um, its uh, maritime archaeology is still is uh, still in its infancy in Singapore, so so to speak. So uh, as you know, it's a, it's also a very complicated uh, 
you know, area in terms of research, especially when uh, Singapore waters are, are complex uh, in a sense where um, there are a lot of stakeholders as well as a lot of activities going on. So uh, uh, as far as for my colleague, uh, Michael and I, um, our uh, research work uh, 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 does not really fall under the uh, responsibility of policy making. So, but we are advising our colleagues in the National Heritage Board uh, who are working out uh, the, the complexities, you know, in regards to this. Uh, I, I hope this answers your question. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to add on this? Yeah, uh, probably allow me to chip in a little bit. Uh, so, one of the things that we actually adhere to, uh, and actually both Aaron and I will actually agree on it, is actually the usage of the UNESCO training manual for uh, as, as a guideline, especially for the UNESCO World Heritage, uh, UNESCO 2001 convention, um, uh, the entire convention itself actually provides a very important guide to us. Um, in terms of policing, we are merely policing areas to make sure that there are no what we call souvenir pickers. Thankfully, you know, in terms of looters, we may not experience that many, but it's always the souvenir pickers that are always giving issues at um, heritage sites. So a lot of it actually has to do with a lot of education and engagement. Uh, we, 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 are, we are currently engaging to some extent, but it's still not enough. And also because our legislation is still ongoing, so there's uh, a lot of it will be done on the really on the grassroots level or, or people that uh, either Aaron and I actually interact with and we'll try to convey to them and educate them on the proper procedures in terms of uh, any archaeological finds or any reporting of of, of sorts. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the questions and also the good answers and response given by both of our presenters. I guess there are no more questions. So can we have a round of applause to both our presenters from Singapore? Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now move to the presentation from our northern neighbor, Thailand. The presenter will be Mr. Wong Sakon Rahotan from Underwater Archaeology Division, Chantaburi, Thailand. Mr. Fong Sokon is a maritime archaeologist who works for Underwater Archaeology Division, Fine Arts Department, Thailand, graduated in BA Archaeology from Silpakorn University in 2010. He has undergone training in underwater archaeology, namely principles of underwater archaeology training 2013 in Chantaburi, Thailand, Vietnam Underwater Archaeology Training in 2015 in Hoi An, Vietnam, and the Belt and Road Underwater Archaeologist Training Program 2017 in Guangdong Province, China. He has been part of the many underwater archaeological survey excavation projects in Thailand. With the title of The Challenges and the Opportunity on the Protection of Thailand's Underwater Cultural Heritage During the Pandemic, I will now hand it over to you, Mr. Wong Sokon. Thank you. It's, is it audible? We can't see your slides. Okay, but you can hear me, right? Yes, and also your video. Okay. Is my slide on? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you. My name is Wong Sukon Rohotan, but you can also call me Pan if you will. I'm an underwater archaeologist, work for Underwater Archaeology Division, Fine Arts Department, Thailand. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, Mis the Ministry of Tourism, Art and Culture of Malaysia, Department of National Heritage, as well as the University of Malaysia, Taranganu, for organizing and allowing me and also my Thai colleagues to participate in this seminar. Today, my presentation 
entitled The Challenges and the Opportunity on the Protection of Thailand's Underwater Cultural Heritage During the Pandemic. This talk will be focusing on the current stage of the protection of underwater cultural heritage in Thailand. Before we go to the main content, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my unit, the UAD. The roots of the Thailand's underwater archaeology it start, started in 1974 when the fishermen found that they had thrown out the ancient ceramics from the seabed near Gok Kram. News spreading to the ears of the treasure hunter, the looters, and the private collectors, and the sites were becoming like a black market for illegal and immoral salvaging for selling the price. Later, the Fine Arts Department, or the FAD, the agency that responsible for the cultural heritage, kicks in. But due to their inexperience in maritime or diving capability, the FAD therefore contacted the Royal Thai Navy for assistance to stop the illegal salvaging. Later in 1977, the Fine Arts Department set up the Underwater Archaeology Project to carry out a survey and excavation on the Kram shipwreck. And this project later would be the foundation of the Underwater Archaeology Division. Now we move on to the prominent sites, prominent underwater archaeology sites that the UAD have been working so far. The underwater cultural heritage in Thailand can be categorized into four periods. The prehistoric period, the Dwarvati and Sivichaya period, the Siamese kingdom period, and also the industrial period. I'd like to talk a bit about the map showing in, um, in this slide. Uh, as you can see, um, this map shows the points of the uh, shipwreck sites and other cultural heritages that, that we've been found in the Gulf of Thailand and also in the, the Western Andaman Sea. But you can also point out that the site is accumulated in the Eastern part of Thailand. And the reason is that it could be, because most of them are the, the shipwreck from the uh, Siamese Kingdoms period during the 14th to uh, 18th century. Um, you can you can assume that it because of the the route, the area it was uh, could be the shipping lanes at that time of the prosperous trading period. So we can so so that's why we have a lot of uh, uh, shipwrecks around the east the east eastern seaboard, but it also can tell us that uh, because our our unit is located in in here, so it also can can point out that because of our our capability of conducting survey, it's uh, because we are, are the oldest unit that uh, working on the underwater ecology. So uh, the location of the 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 office is here. That's why. Um, the operating range of the uh, of the of the units it's not very far, so that's why the the accumulation of the site it's it's over on the eastern side of Thailand. Now we move on to the some of the prominent site that I would like to show. This site it's from one of our recent um, field work, not very recent, in 2017. The UAD was informed by the regional office of fine arts that they had found what appears to be a large mysterious plat wooden platform on the beach of Klong uh, Krui in Renan province. The location of the site itself is close to the prehistoric archaeological site Phu Khao Tong. The AMS dating from the wood sample revealed that the timbers date to uh, 2,300 BP, and due to the physical effects of the wave and tides, the, de the deterioration of the timbers of the sites went so rapidly. So um, after we investigated the site, we decided to recover all of the timber. 
and bring them back to the UAV office in Chantaburi for conservation. The woodworking technique presented in the rec resembles the wood construction technique called the tenon and mortise technique. It can be found in the Khufu ship in Egypt and was extensively used in ancient shipbuilding to assemble hull planks and other watercraft components together in the Phoenician culture. Considering the age of the wood, the Pakongkwe shipwreck has been regarded as one of the oldest existing, existing of wood vessel in Southeast Asia. Now we move on to another slide, another rec. Um, this one is also from the prehistory period. Uh, we have discovered this site in 2019 uh, in part of the Southern Survey Project. One of the very interesting discovery from this survey was uh, pieces of timbers that uh, resemble the early latch lock boat building. Uh, the boat was found in Kong Tom Canal uh, near Wat Kong Tom, where the uh, famous Kong Tom Beach Museum is located. We took the sample of the woods for the AMS dating, and it and it reveals that the wood itself dated to 1800 BP. So, this is. Uh, the evidence of the existing of the lash lock board, the oldest lash lock board found in Thailand. Now we move on to the next period. Uh, this period is the Dwarodi and Sivichai, Sivichai period. This period is defined as the uh, proto history of the Thai, um, Thai, uh, Thai history itself. And as you can see from these two photos, these are the example of the um, the lash lock boat that we just recently found in 2019. The left picture is the Ban Krong Yuan boat. Uh, the AMS dating suggests that the boat was built around 8th century. The boat itself was found near the ancient town of Chai Chaya in Suratani province. And considering the building technique, the using of wing end and double edge, the boat resemble the building technique of Panchuajo boat in Indonesia and also the Butuan boat in the Philippines. This boat is one of the most intact lash lock boats that have uh, been found in Thailand. Uh, actually, we have found uh, other lash lock, but there were just um, small pieces of them. The picture of the right is also another piece of lash lock timber found in Kok Huang, sub district Jantaburi. Uh, and um, this slide is our recent project, which is the excavation of the Son ship Phnom Surin, the, S, the 8th century Son ship found in the stream farm in Smutsakorn province. This ship was accidentally discovered by the farm owner in 2013. The wreck itself is considered the second Arabian sewn ship found in the Southeast Asia. The other one people uh, already already well known, the Belitum shipwreck. Although discovered for a long time, the full scale excava excavation uh, had been done to the site just uh, early this year with the UAD collab collaborated with the first regional office of fine arts, we are able to set up the full scale excavation, excavation project that aim to um, uncover, examine and recover all of the artifacts in its cargo, as well as to study the feasibility of salvaging the ship itself. After eight months of the field work, we were able to excavate and document half of its port site, including uh, as well as the bow and the stern section of the ship. The recovered artifacts were moved to the Ganjana Pisit Museum in Patum Thani province for conservation and the publication is still in progress because we were just finished in uh, last September. We move on to the next period, which is the um, 
which I call the Siamese Kingdom period. And in this period, it is regarded as the most prosperous era of the maritime trade in Thai history. After the establishment of the capital city of Yutria in the early 14th century, this capital city of Thai people has expanded its influence into the neighboring countries. In addition, in this period, the famous Thai pottery, namely Sankalok, were from Sisachanalai Kin sites and four loops jars from the Menanmar Kin site in Simbri province, have spread throughout the Southeast Asian. And it was so, and it were also present in numbers of shipwrecks, I think throughout all of the Southeast Asian. Okay. And this is the last of my category. It is the industrial period dated from 19th to 20th century. Actually, there has been many shipwrecks that can be sought in this category, but because uh, the date is so close to the present day, there are so many government agencies that is responsible for the wreck itself. One of the industrial period shipwrecks that is uh, fully responsible for the UAD, it's the Manok shipwreck. Uh, the 40 meter long, 6 meter wide steamship sank near Manok Island in Rayong province. The ship was discovered in 2008 by the local diving tourism. And due to the, the depth of the site, it's not very deep and the location is very near from the shore. The UAD had chosen the site to be the field practice for the um, UNESCO Regional Capacity Building Program or underwater cultural heritage since 2009 to 2011. Okay. In this slide, I just like to show and point out the important how good relations between um, our, our unit and other parties. In February, 2020, the UAD was informed by the local administration that they have found the ancient canal Yera Shanoi Island in Phuket province. As I mentioned earlier, the UAD office is in the Gulf of Thailand. Although we have the survey board, but we are not able to take a boat across the peninsula. So instead of renting boat, as we used to do, we try, we try to contact the Royal Thai Navy or RTN and ask if the Navy can provide or support us with the vessel to carry out our survey. And unexpectedly, instead of landing at a small boat or fast water craft they have, um, the RTN supported us with the um, large warship, as you can see from the bottom left of the photo, the HTMS Hirasha, and also the personnel from the Navy SEALs team to support us. <laughs> which is amazing. As you can see, this is, um, you can see how important and the potential of the cooperation relation it can do. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about legal aspects in terms of the protection of the underwater archeological site in Thailand. As you can see from the slides, Although we have a long history of underwater archaeology of almost 50 years, still in Thailand, we have direct legal tools to define and protect the underwater cultural heritage, like those in Malaysia and Indonesia. Therefore, we need to implement the Act on Ancient Monuments, Antiques, Objects of Art, and National Museums, 1992, which most of the, con all of the contents in this Act mainly it's about protection of the territorial heritages. Also, we also implement the other maritime laws. And um, in my opinion, in order to protect the rich underwater cultural heritage, the feasibility of the legislation regarding the protection of the underwater cultural heritage in Thailand, it's needed. During 2009 to 2011, um, due to the destruction from the 2004 tsunami that hit Sri Lanka, the UNESCO chose Thailand to be the alternative training center for the UNESCO Regional Capacity Building Program for Underwater Cultural Heritage. Together with the UNESCO, 
the UAD had been able to hold three courses of foundation course on underwater cultural heritage, two advanced courses on GIS application in management of underwater archaeology, and advanced course on in situ preservation, and have trained 76 personnel from the seven countries. And together with the SPAFA in 2013, uh, we are able to help to choose uh, the principle of underwater archaeology training program under the Southeast Asian Collaborative Program of Underwater Archaeology. I think um, many of us here in the, this seminar are, are, the, are the alumni of one of the courses, right? And anybody who is UNESCO and SPAFA alumni, please show yourself, click on any reaction. Please. <laughs> okay. Oh, a lot of them. <laughs> okay. Um, not just that, after the UNESCO and the SPAFA program, the UAD also organized uh, its own funding international training program as well. In 2015, um, the UAD organized the ASEAN Underwater Archaeology Workshop on Underwater Cultural Heritage Site Recording and Finds Conservation, which took place in Samutsakon province. In 2016, the ASEAN Underwater Cultural Heritage Workshop on Alternative Solution in Extended Frontier held in Manok Shipwreck, Royal Province. And um, the last presenter, also part of this uh, program, Mr. Michael. Uh, in this slide, uh, I just want to show that uh, this is the uh, training pool that we built for supporting the future trainings uh, for both international and domestic program. The pool itself is 25 meters long, 15 meters wide, and 12 meters deep. I hope in the future, after the pandemic has ended, we will be able to organize more courses um, so we can be together again. Oh, okay. 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 Um, last year in 2020, during the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the planned projects in the 2020 fiscal year was all cancelled. Before that, we plan to organize the big symposiums and underwater archaeologist training, uh, the, the domestic training, and all could not be carried out due to the strict measures and lockdown by the government. So with concern that the people who did not go anywhere during the lockdown would be get bored, we decided to set up a YouTube channel. And this is not very a big production like the mainstream media, just um, a couple of cameras, a microphone, and a very, our new looking figure. We started to produce the video providing the story of our work and underwater cultural heritage. And this is not very academic one. And unbelievable, the video we produce draw so much of the attention not only from the general public, but also the mainstream and journalism. This is potentially help us to create more of a network to provide uh, of the people who are interested in maritime archaeology. Uh, sometimes uh, we can, uh, we, we are informed about the trace of the new shipwrecks, uh, as well as the illegal activities from, from this social media. To summarize, the underwater archaeology and underwater cultural heritage in Thailand was started in 1974. Maritime archaeology evidence found so far suggested that the maritime activities in Thailand can be dated as early as 2300 years ago. And due to the highly developed capacity, the UAD has been chosen to be the host country for numbers of international underwater archaeology trainings. Although Thailand has its long history of underwater archaeology. The country still lacks the direct legal 
tools to protect the UCH and must rely on the relevant maritime laws. During the 2020 to 2021, Thailand has been affected by the global epidemic. Many plans projects have been canceled. The agency, the UAD focuses more on the public uh, relation via the online platform. In conclusion, uh, the underwater archaeology division is the only it's only the sole agency in Thailand located in Chantapuri that responsible for protection of underwater cultural heritage without any branch offices. Therefore, when considering the vast territor territory of the sea area, the surveillance of those heritage is limited and strict enforcement of the law is likely improbable. However, good relationship between stakeholders, both government parties such as Royal Thai Navy, Maritime Department, etc., and the private parties such as diver and fishermen networks help providing us useful information of new discovery as well as, well as alerting on illegal activities. In recent years, during the pandemic, the UAD turns more of our attention to the general public via online platforms. The, in, this increases more engagement not only from the general public, but also attention from the mainstream media and helps us to generate the awareness of the from the general public of the importance of and values of the underwater cultural heritage, which are particularly useful for the long term protection of the underwater cultural heritage. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ben. Look like your colleagues from the UNESCO Asian program been cheering for you. Good to see that. <laughs> and it's also you made it very clear in your presentation that underwater archaeology is a multidisciplinary field, but it requires the collaboration and cooperation of many other agencies to pull it off. So this is not a simple process that requires various levels of protection taking place. So thank you for clarifying on that. So do we have any questions? I see none. So thanks again to Mr. Pan. So can we give him a round of applause before proceeding for the next session? Ladies and gentlemen, last but not the least, we will be listening to the presentation from Vietnam presented by Mr. Nguyen Man Tang, Head of Archaeology Department, Vietnam National Museum of History, who will be presenting on research, preservation, and promotion of heritage values of ancient shipwrecks in Vietnam Sea, potentiality and orientation. Mr. Mr. Nguyen is a head of archaeology department from Vietnam National Museum of History since 1996, graduated in social science and humanities, majoring in history from Hanoi University in 1994, and has a master's degree on archaeology in 2007. Mr. Nguyen, I pass this virtual floor to you. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, could you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. Uh, our technical team, is he muted? No. Could you come closer to your device? Mr. Nguyen, are you still there? Uh, 
I guess our presenter having some technical problems. Uh, we'll try to fix it. I kindly request our participants. Can you hear me? Hello? Ah, yes. Is it from Ms. Teng Nguyen? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you, ma'am. Are you with Mr. Nguyen? Yeah, uh, I will have Mr. Nguyen to um, translate from Vietnam to English. So um, we are very honored to participate in this seminar. And uh, now Mr. Tang will present uh, the presentation. And may I share my screen? Sure, ma'am. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. So we kindly request you to put it in the presentation mode. Okay. Um, I would like to present about the research, preservation, and promotion of the heritage value and essential rate in Vietnam Sea potential uh, and uh, uh, Madam, sorry orientation. To uh, can you put it in the full screen mode? Slideshow mode. Uh, it's at the bottom. On... Can you see it? Excuse me, can you see? Yes, we can see it, but can you put it in a slideshow mode so we can zoom in your presentation? It's at the bottom part of your slide. Bottom. We can see your slide. We just required it to be put. Yes, now it's clear. Thank you. you may proceed. Okay. Okay. Việt Nam là một quốc gia nằm ở phía đông bán đảo Nguyễn Dương với đường bờ biển dài 3.260 km. Vietnam is a country located in the east of the Indochina Peninsula in Southeast Asia. Sau vị trí nằm bán đảo trên tuyến đường biển nối Thái Bình Dương và Ấn Độ Dương, nên vùng biển Việt Nam có vị thế đặc biệt quan trọng. Due to its located on the east west maritime route connecting the Pacific and Atlantic, the Vietnam area seas has a part particularly important position in economic and cultural heritage with all the country. Việt Nam sớm tham gia vào các đường thương mại trên biển, uh, trong đó có mặt hàng xuất khẩu quan trọng là đường gốm và là quốc gia có nhiều cái tiềm năng về nghiên cứu bảo tồn và phát huy giá trị những di sản văn hóa dưới nước, đặc biệt là những uh, con cầu đá. And Vietnam participate in sea trade work in which the most important import and export item was ceramic. And Vietnam is a country with a great potential in researching, preservation, and promotion of the values of underwater cultural heritage, especially Asian coastal harbor and Asian Cypric. Công tác bảo tồn và phát huy những giá trị di sản tàu đắm cổ vùng biển Việt Nam. Researching, preservation, and promotion of the value of Asian Cypric heritage in Vietnam Sea. Từ năm 1990 đến nay, trên vùng biển Việt Nam đã phát hiện hàng chục con tàu đắm, trong đó có bảy con tàu được khai quật gồm. From 1990 to now, Vietnam has discovered many ship carrying a shotgun ceramic in its sea, including seven ship which were exploited. Tàu cổ hàng cao nằm ở độ sâu 6, 40 mét và được khai quật từ tháng 6 năm 90 cho đến tháng 7 năm 91. The Hong Kong Asian ship which in Barrier province located in the depth of 14 meters excavated from June 1990. 
Kết quả đã xác định được con tàu dài 32,71 m rộng gần 9 m và chờ hiện vật thu được là gồm hơn 60.000 hiện vật. In July 1991, the excavation, preservation and classification completed and there were 60,000 objects excavated mainly focusing on Chinese ceramic dating back to 1690. And there's some uh, image of um, what is forgetted uh, from Hong Kong as a secret. Tàu cổ Hòn Dầm, tỉnh Kiên Giang được khai quật vào tháng 591, nằm ở đường sâu 17 m và có chiều dài tàu có chiều dài 30 m rộng gần 7 m kết quả đã thu được 16.000 hiện vật chủ yếu là đồ gốm men gọc và men đâu có nguồn gốc sản xuất từ lò sao ăn khai lớp thái lan the hòn dâm asian ship brick in kinzang bovin war is located in may 1990 the asian ship brick has the length of nearly 13 meters um, nearly 16,000 objects of silicon and uh, brown pottery have been recovered uh, from um, so one color pottery cleans in the 15th century. Tàu cổ Cù Lao Tràm nằm ở độ sâu 70 đến 72 m được khai quật từ tháng 5 năm 97 cho đến tháng 6 năm 1999. Cù Lao Tràm is a secret was excavated from May 1997 to June 1999. Tàu dài 29,4 m rộng gần 7 m và thu được 240.000 hiện vật chủ yếu là đồ gốm xứ của gốm chu đậu Hải Dương và Thăng Long Hà Nội có liên đại vào khoảng thế kỷ cuối thế kỷ 15. The number of antiques collected is over 240,000 objects, mainly blue flower ceramic produced in Chu Đậu, Hải Dương province and Thăng Long Hà Nội, dating from the second half of the 15th century. Trên đây một số hình ảnh khai quật tàu cổ của Lao Trà. There is some image of uh, object was bracketed on the Kuala Lumpur secret. Tàu cổ Cà Mau, tàu được khai quật từ tháng 8 năm 98 cho đến tháng 10 năm 99 nằm ở độ sâu 35 m. Tàu còn dấu vết, tàu chỉ còn có dấu vết dài khoảng 24 m rộng gần 8 m. The Cà Mau Asian ship wreck in Hama province was excavated from August 1997 to um, October 1999 and uh, more than 60,000 objects were recovered. Số lượng hộp hiện vật thu được là 60.000 hiện vật nhưng mà cái số lượng mà hiện vật thu giữ do ngư dân chủ vớt trái phép là lên đến 130.000 hiện vật. Cho nên một số những hình ảnh khai quật sâu cổ Cà Mau. Many object in this uh, secret um, are white and blue ceramic from China and this is the first underwater archaeology excavation complete found by the states conducted by Vietnamese archaeologists and divers. Tàu cổ Bình Thuận được khai quật năm 2021, 2022 là một đường sâu 39, 40 m, tàu có chiều dài 25,4 m, rộng 7,2 m và thu được hơn 61 ngàn hiện vật. Is the Bình Thuận Asian ship wreck in Bình Thuận province was excavated from 2001 to 2002, and more than 60,000 objects were excavated and mainly from Chinese ceramic. Trên đây là một số những cái hình vật của tàu cổ Bình Thuận. Tàu cổ Bình Châu, tàu cổ Bình Châu được khai quật uh, trong tháng 6 năm 2013. Kết quả đã thu được uh, 268 thùng hiện vật. Và sau khi mà thủ hút cái bùn cát ở xung quanh cái tàu này được thu lên 6 uh, thùng hiện vật. Tàu có chiều dài được khoảng 20,5 mét, ngang rộng nhất là 5,6 mét và chia 13 khoang. The Bình Thuận Asian ship wreck in Quảng Ngãi province was discovered from um, 2013 and there are about 268 boxes of objects were collected, uh, including original and broken one. And some metal items were found on this uh, ship wreck such as bronze, minor bronze, red, box nails, copper coins found inside. And the goods in the ship are Chinese ceramic dating from the 13th century. Tàu cổ Dương Quốc được phát hiện tháng 7 năm 2017 và được khai quật vào từ tháng 2 đến tháng 4 năm 2019. 
à, tàu có <cười> trên à, trên tàu có số lượng hiện vật thu được gần à, 10.000 tiêu bản mảnh gốm chủ yếu là đồ gốm à, xứ Trung Quốc à, có liên đại vào thời bạn lịch năm bảy ba một sáu hai không và một số niên hiệu trên tàu này thì là ghi nhái lại của những cái đời vua trước theo thứ thị trường. The Dung Quất uh, Secret to Discover in night uh, in 2017 a ceramic on ship a man blue and white porcelain some are white glass porcelain and a few are white glass porcelain. You decorated with multicolor on glaze and the last a brown glaze that make good take work but mainly in broken condition. Số những cái đồ gốm xứ là những cái hiện vật uh, hoa lam rồi đen trắng của chiếc tàu uh, Trung Quốc. Như vậy sau uh, hơn 30 năm kết quả nghiên cứu khai quật thì uh, các uh, trên vùng biển Việt Nam đã thu được hơn 500 ngàn tiêu bản hiện vật uh, chủ yếu chúng có cái đồ gốm xứ có nguồn gốc Việt Nam, Thái Lan và Trung Quốc có liên đại từ thế kỷ 13 đến 18. After more than 13 years, there is about 500,000 ceramic objects from Vietnam, Thailand and China were collected from the 13th to the 18th century. Tuy nhiên, những phần lớn những cái uh, cuộc khai quật này đều do các doanh nghiệp nước ngoài hoặc là tư nhân uh, đầu tư. Nên uh, hiện vật sau khi khai quật đã phải là uh, phân chia cho uh, các doanh nghiệp nước ngoài và một số những cái xác tàu thì không lấy được nên là đã không uh, dẫn đến cái, không có cái kết quả nghiên cứu kỹ càng về cái khảo uh, cổ. Most of the above mentioned extensive with excavation were conducted based on the funding of domestic and foreign enterprises. Từ những cái bất cập như thế nên chúng tôi đã đề ra một số những cái đề xuất định hướng cho công tác nghiên cứu bảo tồn và phát huy những cái giá trị di sản của đám cổ vùng biển Việt Nam như sau. Some proposal and orientation for research, conservation and promotion of the value of ancient secret heritage in Vietnam Sea. Chúng tôi đầu đầu tiên là phải cần xác định rõ đối tượng mục tiêu của phương pháp nghiên cứu khai quật. Vì nếu chúng ta xác định rõ được như vậy thì uh, chúng ta sẽ có um, làm hạn chế và là giúp cho cái kết quả nghiên cứu sẽ được tốt hơn rất là nhiều. Firstly, it's necessary to determine the objective and methods of research and exploration. If the objectives are clearly, are clearly defined and expectations are conducted in a uh, scientific and uh, methodical, surely the collected scientific information will make an important con uh, contribution to the process of research, display, introduction and um, reconstructing of the sea journey of, of ship as well as the Asian trade route of Vietnam and other countries in the Sea of Vietnam. And uh, this is the limitation that Vietnam has uh, encountered from the exploration of Asian secret in recent years. Thứ hai là cần sớm xây dựng và phát triển đội ngũ các nhà nghiên cứu khoa học dưới nước chuyên nghiệp vì thực tế ở Việt Nam hiện nay là rất là thiếu những cái đội ngũ như thế này. Những nhà khảo cổ học thì không biết lặn, người biết lặn thì không có chuyên môn về khảo cổ nên điều này đã dẫn đến những cái kết quả rất là hạn chế cho cái công tác nghiên cứu khoa học khoa học dưới nước. Secondly, it's necessary to training and improve in the qualification of underwater archaeology researcher Under, underwater archaeological education in recent years in vietnam had faced difficulties due to the lack of professional staff therefore the research and exploration is not highly effective <coughs> trong gần 10 năm qua nhận thức được cái vấn đề này thì bảo tàng lịch sử quốc gia Việt Nam cũng như viện khảo cổ học đã cử một số những cái cán bộ trẻ uh, tham gia những lớp đào tạo tập huấn ở tại Hàn Quốc, Thái Lan uh, để có cái khả năng uh, lặn và nghiên cứu dưới nước được nhưng mà vẫn còn uh, so với thực tế thì những cái điều này vẫn chưa đáp ứng được và cần phải cố gắng rất là nhiều nữa. In the past five years, the Vietnam National Museum of History and in the Institute of Archaeology have sent many young researchers to attend diving training course in Korea and Thailand. And up to now, Vietnamese archaeology has not been able to meet all the party, um, practical and urgent requirements for this particular site. Cái thứ ba là chúng ta cần phải xây dựng hệ thống pháp lý uh, đồng bộ chặt chẽ trong việc bảo vệ những cái di sản văn hóa dưới nước. Thirdly, uh, it's necessary to establish a strict and um, synchronous legal system for the protection of underwater archaeological heritage. Thứ tư ấy, thì là cần xây dựng những cái cơ sở, những quy trình bảo quản, uh, trưng bày và phát huy những giá trị di sản văn hóa dưới nước này, đặc biệt là những về cái công tác bảo quản, cũng cái công tác uh, trưng bày phát huy 
giá trị di sản văn hóa về nước à, và những cái điều này là những cái những bài học của, à, và kinh nghiệm quốc tế rất là hữu ích cho Việt Nam trong việc à, góp phần xây dựng những trung tâm như thế này. A formally is necessary to building a basic and process of preservation, displaying and promotion for the value of underwater cultural heritage. Kết luận, Việt Nam là một trong những cái quốc gia rất là giàu tiềm năng về di sản văn hóa dưới nước, thì đặc biệt là những di sản từ tàu cổ chìm đắm, nhưng mà cũng đang đối mặt với rất nhiều thách thức mà trong việc nghiên cứu bảo tồn phát huy những giá trị di sản này. And Vietnam is one of the country with a loss of potential for under, underwater cultural heritage, especially the heritage of Asian Cypric. However, Vietnam is also facing many difficulties and obstacles in the research, preservation and promotion of underwater cultural heritage. Từ thực tiễn hơn 30 năm nghiên cứu và qua 7 cuộc khai quật như vậy, thì chúng tôi nhận thấy là Việt Nam đến lúc cần phải đẩy mạnh công tác xây dựng cái trung tâm khoa học lớn, xây dựng đội ngũ. Uh, chuyên gia chuyên nghiệp được đào tạo trang bị những thiết bị phương tiện bài bản uh, và có cái hướng chiến lược chủ động trong việc uh, công tác khảo sát là bản đồ di tích quản lý quốc gia về những cái uh, xác định chiến lược di tích khi vật khảo học đi nước này. And currently compared to the developed country and within Southeast Asia, Vietnam's underwater archaeology is in a backward range. Therefore, Vietnam's underwater archaeology also needs to strengthen cooperation and association with domestic and foreign research institutions. At the same time, university and college is necessary to develop um, curricular and teaching contents on underwater archaeological and consider it as a subject for students. Nếu so với cả các nước trên thế giới và còn đặc biệt một số nước Đông Nam Á thì Việt Nam có một cái khoảng cách tụt hậu khá xa về khoảng cách phía nước. Vì vậy muốn mà đẩy mạnh cái công tác này thì chúng tôi cũng thiết nghĩ cùng cần phải đẩy mạnh cái hợp tác và nghiên cứu hội thảo trong nước quốc tế thì mới có thể góp phần giúp cho cái công tác nghiên cứu và phát huy bảo tồn di sản văn hóa đi nước Việt Nam ngày càng tốt hơn và hoàn thiện hơn. Xin cảm ơn các bạn. And education and communication work needs to uh, pay more attention in order to raise people awareness, especially in she areas where they are uh, sensitive about the value of underwater cultural heritage associated with the develop, uh, developing uh, tourism to help them improve their life. And uh, in addition, it's necessary to have to uh, to um, prevent illegal surveying of underwater antiquities as well as to stop theft and illegal trade in antiquity that take place in some like, um, localities. And thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tang, for taking us through to the processes, activities, research, and also proposals from the practice of underwater cultural heritage in Vietnam. So do we have any questions? As of now, I see none of questions. I believe most of our participants are quite full with what have been fed to them by, by our respected speakers. So, if we don't have any questions, thank you to Mr. Tang and to all of our presenters throughout the whole day for your presentation. So, can we all give all of them a good round of applause? Thank you. I believe through all the presentation throughout the whole day, we have finally brought the underwater cultural heritage of ASEAN to your screen, albeit virtually. So with that, we will conclude our presentation session and I will now hand it back to our MCs. Thank you and terima kasih. Sama-sama Encik Sanji uh, dan juga terima kasih kepada anda yang masih lagi bersama dengan kami di seminar pada petang ini. Jadi itu dah saja 10 pementangan dari negara-negara yang turut serta untuk hari ini. ya. Uh, uh, jadi uh, untuk sesi petang ini, seterusnya kita akan menjemput Encik Jonathan Tan Gi Tiong Asian Secretary bagi menyampaikan ucapan penutup menerusi video yang akan disiarkan sebentar lagi. Thank you so much Mr Sanjay and all those who presented this now. We now invite Mr Jonathan Tan Githiong, the Secretary for ASEAN, 
to say a few words to conclude this program. Distinguished speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to all. I'm privileged to address you on behalf of the ASEAN Secretariat at the closing of the ASEAN Seminar on the Preservation and Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. First of all, I would like to convey my heartfelt thanks and compliments to the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture of Malaysia, the Department of National Heritage and the University Malaysia Trunganu for the successful convening of this seminar and launch of the ASEAN Underwater Mini Landmark. The seminar on the preservation and protection of underwater cultural heritage has been an outstanding opportunity to learn about the current developments in the safeguarding of underwater cultural heritage in ASEAN. Allow me to summarize some of the key takeaways that I think we can learn from the presentations of our ASEAN experts. First, underwater cultural heritage holds great importance in fostering a regional sense of identity founded upon a shared history. The ASEAN region has long been at the crossroads of maritime trade, resulting in an abundance of cultural and archaeological sites that reveal the intimacy and intricacy of historic ties between our countries. Thus, continual research and discovery of these artifacts are necessary for us to gain a better understanding of ASEAN's rich heritage, which in turn can raise awareness and promote ASEAN identity. Second, we must continue to build the capacities of people and institutions working to safeguard ASEAN's underwater cultural heritage from the ever-present threats of exploitative tourism, fishing and industrial activities, illegal looting and piracy, unsustainable coastal developments, climate change, and extreme weather, as well as disasters, both human-induced and natural. This has become increasingly important during the current pandemic where preventive measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 pandemic have created another layer to the challenges in protecting underwater cultural heritage. Third, underwater cultural heritage sites can boost tourism and provide an additional economic livelihood for surrounding communities. But this must be balanced carefully to prevent the degradation of these sites. To this end, we must educate and engage the public and local communities to encourage responsible, sustainable, and non-intrusive access to such cultural heritage properties. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the protection of ASEAN's underwater cultural heritage is a responsibility shared by us all. Therefore, we must continue our concerted efforts by regularly sharing knowledge and expertise, improving data collection and management, and pursuing joint collaborations between countries and institutions. We must also highlight and communicate the importance of the protection of underwater cultural heritage as a means to achieve the sustainable development goals. I would like to thank all experts from the ASEAN member states for sharing your rich experiences and insights to safeguard and manage underwater cultural heritage, especially during these exceptional times. I hope that the discussions generated have been able to give us a more nuanced, deeper and richer understanding of the importance of preserving and promoting our underwater cultural assets and may give rise to a strong network of institutions and experts who can work together to promote and protect ASEAN's underwater legacy. Thank you very much. Terima kasih kepada Encik Jonathan Tan Gi Tiong atas ucapan penutup sebentar tadi. Dan kepada anda semua, sekali lagi kami akan menyiarkan video ASEAN Underwater Mini Landmark yang telah dijalankan pada 8 November 2021 yang lepas. Thank you Mr. Jonathan Tan Gi Tiong for your kind words. And um, as a last... Uh, present for everybody. Let's watch a video showing the uh, mini landmark that was launched recently.
Demikian tadi video ASEAN Underwater Mini Landmark yang menjadi penutup untuk seminar kita pada hari ini. Terima kasih sekali lagi. Saya mewakili wakil uh, program ini ingin mengucapkan terima kasih kepada semua pembentang dari negara-negara ASEAN dan juga semua peserta-peserta seminar pada hari ini. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your participation and support of this program. We've now come to the conclusion of this seminar, which has been so important because we've been discussing about preserving and procuring our underwater heritage. Thank you so much. Jadi dari kami, terima kasih. Harap maaf sekiranya ada sebarang uh, kesalahan. Tapi sebelum itu, Kak Goja, uh, terima kasih kerana menjadi partner Azrin untuk seminar kali ini. Kita ingin menjemput semua teknikal kru yang telah menjayakan seminar secara hybrid ini, secara maya dan juga fizikal. Dipersilakan Encik Ruzairi RB, Dr. Hasrizal, Puan Fariza dan juga semua tim dari Jabatan Warisan Negara dan juga Universiti Malaysia Terengganu. We now invite everybody who's been a part of this process and uh, please to come to the stage. Come on up and let's all take our bows. Come on up everyone, let's go. Well, akhir kata dari kami, terima kasih. InsyaAllah kita jumpa lagi tahun depan. InsyaAllah, let's see all each other next year. Thank you everybody. Everybody take a bow. Take a bow. <laughs>